I'm Joanne Daminger, and I am the Dean of Student Affairs at Salem Community College. We are a small but very vibrant community college in southern New Jersey. In my role as Dean of Student Affairs here, I oversee all student services, and that of course includes advising. It certainly is my pleasure today to, pre to present this webinar, Ethical Issues in Academic Advising. I hope that you will find today's topic as interesting as I do. Those of you who might not find it interesting, though, might be with us today because you know how necessary it is. And I think that many of us would agree that this is a topic that at times can be confusing. Throughout today's presentation, I invite you and actually encourage you to think about what goes on in your own mind when you are making decisions about your interactions with students. What happens in your department? What happens in your campus? Think about how decisions are actually made. To begin today's presentation, we're going to review some definitions related to ethics. We are also going to learn about some uh, general guiding principles, ethical principles that relate to all practice. And then more specifically, we will discuss uh, ethical guidelines from the advising and the CAS standards literature. Finally, we will discuss how to resolve dilemmas that may arise in your own practice and on your own campus. Let's begin by defining ethics. From Webster, we know that ethics is the study of how we act. It really is the study of the way human beings behave. Ethics is also the basic principle of right action, and that's very important for us to remember. It also is defined as the study of morals, the study of the choices that one makes in relating to others. So it's about our morals and our moral choice choices. And last but not least, we can also say that ethics pertains to the rules that govern a, a specific profession, such as, of course, the advising profession. But today we are going to concentrate on the definition that comes to us from Mark Lowenstein. Uh, his definition, simply stated, tells us that ethics is how people should act. Lowenstein uh, says that ethics is a critical thought process by which we, as humans, human beings, determine what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad, but also sometimes what can be more right than other times. Let's move on and discuss a few more definitions. Legal is a term of which we're all aware. For today's purposes, we will use legal to refer to right and wrong as determined by someone else. Of course, there are other people who make our laws and legally we must obey them. The operative words here are right and wrong as determined by others, not determined by our choice, except for the fact, of course, we have the choice whether or not we want to obey the laws once they're made. Let's discuss moral once again. Moral really involves right and wrong again, but this is determined by ourselves, okay? What do we find morally right and wrong? Values. Values relates to our core beliefs. This is a very individualized thing as our values may change from one to the other. So that takes us back to ethics. Ethics includes right and wrong, but as we've said, it also includes right versus right action. What are you to do as an advisor when two courses of action could be right, but right in different ways? Our study of ethics um, leads us to consider how to determine which of our paths that we're thinking about is most right. Ethics really is the principles of right action. This slide is about two areas of the law that we're just going to discuss briefly. We certainly can't spend too much time on this because it's enough uh, of a topic for another webinar. But agency law pertains to the relationship between an advisor and the institution. Advisors are actually agents of the employing institution, according to the law. Fiduciary law is actually about the relationship between the agent, of which in this case is the advisor, and the student. According to the law, the advisor owes duties of faith, trust, confidence, and candor to students. In our role as agents of our institution and under our fiduciary commitment, um, advisors have a responsibility to always be not knowledgeable, and to be accurate on the services, goals, programs, policies, procedures, or any information that we are asked to share with students. Let's think about a situation where what one says could be misleading without us ever uh, intending for it to be. Let's say that a student meets with an advisor 
and wants uh, information about what actually is the difference between various degrees. So what is the difference between a BA and a BS? Or perhaps an AA, an AS, or an AAS? Now, each advisor might have their own opinion about which is the better uh, path for a student to follow. However, that should not be delivered as the only information that is provided to a student. Factual statements about the uh, particular degree types and also those degree types on our campuses should be provided for each degree. And then we should help the student to formulate their own opinion about which might be the best path for them. Advisor can certainly offer their own personal opinion and let the student know it is their opinion. Um, but it's very important that we provide factual information and accurate information to help students make their own decisions. And that can include our personal opinion, but should not be only our personal opinion. There are many other details about the legalities of advising that were actually covered in a webinar last month. It was called Legal Implications. We're not going to go over any of the details from uh, that particular webinar, with the exception of what you see on the slide now. It is important that we remember from last month's webinar that regarding our court system, Many courts indicate that the relationship between the student and the college and the student and the advisor is going to be evidenced or it's going to be proven based on what appears in the institution's written documents, including, of course, our catalogs, our bulletins, our handouts, our brochures, our, our student handbooks. This tells us how very important it is that what is printed on our campuses is accurate and that what is printed is the same as the information that we are telling students. So important things for us to remember. However, we might be asking ourselves, so how important is this to advisors? What does this mean for advisors? How does this help advisors or how can ethical principles help advisors to know the right path of action? Well, all advisors should use one general rule of thumb in all decision making. And that is what you see on the, on the uh, screen. Always try to maximize the good and minimize the harm. Let's take a closer look at what we mean, because some guidelines here would certainly be very helpful. On this screen now, you see that there are five general ethical principles that advisors can use to decide the most correct course of action. In other words, how they should act. Um, foundations on which they can base their decisions. These five statements we could consider ethical ideals. Let's take a look at them just briefly, and then we'll get to them in more detail. Beneficence really refer refers to doing good. What decision would be the best that we can possibly provide for our students? Non-maleficence. Non-maleficence refers to minimizing the harm. How can we do the least harm? Justice, as we know, is treating all people fairly. And fidelity, excuse me, and respect for persons, I think that's one that we don't really need to define because we're totally aware of that. Fidelity, however, refers to living up to our commitments. Let's take a look at each of these individually now. Let's begin with beneficence. Beneficence is the ideal that helps advisors to focus on always bringing about as much good or well-being as one can to all the people affected by your actions, both directly and indirectly, and both for the short and the long term. A very simple example of this um, is if one, in advising a student, happens to give them the wrong information. Let's say you, an advisor gives a student the wrong registration date. And the student leaves the advising session and the advisor realizes that this has happened. Well, it would be um, just a natural thing that we would call them or we would email the student to let them know about the correct dates. We wouldn't let, let the error continue. And this is a simple example of applying beneficence. Let's look at a case situation. I'm going to give everyone just a minute to read over the screen. These are the cases that were provided in advance. This is the case of Maria. Now, in this case, the advisor made a mistake, and it was probably very unintentional. But the, one of the first things the advisor should do would be uh, to apologize to the student about the mistake. And then the advisor should do all that they can to see if the student in any way could still graduate. Now, that may or may not be possible, but they should try to the best of their ability to try to make that happen. 
some ideas would be perhaps there could be a class that they could find that they could take before graduation and fill the requirement. Uh, the advisor could inquire, is there an intercession that would allow this to be done very quickly? Perhaps on a certain campus an independent study course could be set up. Perhaps if, if the campus's procedure allows, a student might be permitted to walk in graduation with the three to four credits still remaining. That way that student could walk with their class and then finish the course in the summer. The ideal, once again, tells us what ways can we think about to do the most good for the student. The second ideal is non-maleficence, and it reminds us that we must do as much as we can to reduce harm whenever possible. An advisor should always make a decision to avoid harm to the best degree that they can to all the people affected, directly and indirectly, for the short and the long term. A simple example of this might be an advisee who comes to you with a very low GPA, and they want to uh, discuss with you how they plan to sit for a certification exam. The student knows and you know that that particular exam needs a 3.25 GPA. The student very ambitiously begins to discuss all these courses that they're going to take in the next semester, but isn't really talking about the fact of what it's going to take to improve their low GPA in order to meet the requirements for the certification exam. We have a responsibility in order to help that student see um, the, the choices that he, that he or she should be making in order to get the best chance of improving the GPA to sit for the exam. Certainly. Um, Maybe we could bring into the session a GPA calculator. That always helps a student to see the uh, possibilities of improving a GPA or how long it's going to take them. Um, we would want to provide the student with anything that would help them to make an informed decision. We would certainly want to discuss maybe delaying the exam until they could improve that GPA by retaking courses. Perhaps even this is a good time that maybe we find and the student begins to feel they're not in a very uh, well-matched major. So maybe we want to talk about thinking about other majors that are an excellent match for them. Much of this information would be very difficult to deliver and also very difficult for the student to receive. But the way that we present it can certainly make it more understandable, reduce the harm, and also prevent really um, sort of deflating a student. Another example of non-maleficence can be seen in the case of Akeem. Once again, I'll give you just a minute to review the slide. In this case, we should attempt to do the least amount of harm to the student. The advisor could certainly discuss the substitutions with someone else and uh, see if there is, uh, uh, certainly track down the paperwork, and then see is there any way possible that they might be able to use some or all of the courses uh, that were substituted. The advisor could also look to see and consult with others about are there other courses in the student's transcript that maybe they, uh, he or she could use for the requirements. Um, certainly we want to look for the documentation that tells us that the student absolutely cannot follow the previous requirements that they thought that they could follow. We have a responsibility in this case, as always, to advocate for the student, but we also have a responsibility to uphold the policies and procedures of our campuses. Um, there are many things here that could be done to reduce harm or the degree of harm, and that would be our focus in focusing on non-maleficence. The ideal of justice relates to, once again, being fair and equal. What is right for one is right for all. Notice, this doesn't tell us that we have to do exactly the same for everyone. It just means that we have to use equal practices for everyone. There's a case coming up, the case of Sara, and this might help us to understand how an advisor can consider this ideal when deciding a course of action. Please take a minute to review the, the case. Now, you may be thinking in your own environment there that this case sounds absurd, but I happen to know that this actually has happened, and unfortunately, these types of things can happen sometimes. Even though Mr. Jones wants to help the students by getting them in courses that fill quickly, this decision, of course, is unethical on many levels. Although he is doing the most good for one student, he's inadvertently hurting other students, thereby working against both beneficence and non-maleficence. It's also clear to see how this is quite unfair and unjust, and we wouldn't want it to happen on our campuses. Our next ideal is respect. 
Once again, respect is not an ideal that we need to define, but sometimes we can operate out of respect and help a student to understand where we're coming from. This ideal helps us to realize that each student is an individual and should, should be respected for who they are as an individual. That means that we will always be telling the truth, we're going to respect their privacy and confidentiality, and we're going to help them to realize, even if they don't, that we want to help them individually and not have them rely on the information for someone else. We're going to support their individual autonomy. Let's discuss this ideal for a minute with the case of Antoinette and Anthony. Please take a minute to review the case. This case um, demonstrates a good thought process. Each student, as we said, has to be treated with respect and individually, and we want them to know that it's important that we build a relationship with them as an individual and not just get information through uh, other means. The fifth guideline is fidelity. Fidelity is defined as staying true to the things to which we commit. Some commitments are very clear and explicit, such as taking a wedding vow. Other commitments are implied by the nature of the role that comes along with our job. This is the type of commitment that we are held to as a result of our advising commitment. Examples of uh, abiding by fidelity could be an advisor's commitment to always provide accurate advising information all the time, to be kept up to date, to include uh, all the information that a student might need in order to make their own decision within reason, always to tell the truth, always to provide our bias, not to provide our biases, and not to try to influence a student to do what we think is the best for them, but rather they have to make up their own minds. Fidelity reminds us that when something is really right, it is right all the time, and it should be considered right in all situations, regardless of the consequences. Fidelity is also an ideal that we often might see applying between colleagues. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but right now, let's take a look at the case of Hatef. Please take a minute to review the slide. In this case, if in advising a student, you realize that he would not have to take an upper level math course because he has another math that would actually satisfy a requirement, or he could take a lesser math and be provided a waiver, but you want him to take a particular math because you're hoping that he'll pursue something in the future. We all have an obligation to tell the students all of the information and let the students decide the best choice for themselves. This is basing your decision on fidelity. This is also making the right decision based on beneficence, and it includes respect, and it includes the ideal of justice. Now, so far today, with these five ideals that we've been discussing, these are really general ethical principles that could apply to all practices, not just advising. So we may find other places in our lives that we might want to refer to these ideals. But there are also several principles that are specific just to advising. As we take a look at these principles, it is easy to notice the many ways that they overlap with the five principles that we already discussed. Just taking a quick look at the screen, you'll see that we see on here, just as we did in our other five ideals, that being fair and equitable is very important, that helping students with their own decision making is extremely important, that we all are committed to uh, respecting confidentiality, and we also have a responsibility to support our institution. Let's pull that one out and just talk about that for a second and see an example about when it might be conflicting for us to support our institution. Let's say that your campus has a practice where, for specific majors, a student might need a certain grade on a prerequisite in order for that prerequisite to count. Let's just say, for example, in, example, in a uh, nursing program, their anatomy and physiology and their biologies must come in with a C-plus grade. Now, perhaps you as an individual do not really believe that it's that important that the grade be a C plus rather than a C. So you're not so fond of this practice. Um, it would, however, be very unethical to even mention your own beliefs to students because you have a responsibility to uphold the institution's policies and procedures. Now, certainly you would want to talk with a student, especially if they were very upset because they had gotten a C and could not use the prerequisite, but you should not be sharing your own personal thoughts. Rather, you have to find a way to state the institution's principles and practices and support those. 
Now, another great resource for ethical guidelines and training about ethics in the CAS is the CAS standards, the standards from the Council for the Advancement of Standards in Higher Education. You've probably noticed in your handout that the next three, three slides list the CAS guidelines for advisors that relate to ethical principles. And these are all printed in your handout for informational purposes. You don't have to get nervous that we're going to read them all because we're not, but really they're provided there so that you have a more comprehensive set of notes, especially in case you use any of these notes for, your, uh, for advisor development or training on your campuses. So we should take note of the great deal of overlap between these guidelines, the Nakata principles that we just saw, and also the five general principles that we have already talked about. You might see the overlap with confidentiality, accurate information, upholding institutional policies and procedures. Once again, all of these guidelines are printed here not for us to read, but for additional small group discussion or advisor development programs on your campus. On this slide, you will see a reference to justice and equality that we have already discussed, as well as the need to hold all advisors and staff accountable for good ethical decision making. And our third slide with more information from the CAS standards. As you see, the slide continues the principles of which we need to be aware. Let's focus on this slide on the fact that all institutions and advising areas need to have other resources with which they can consult if they need it, especially legal advice or advice about how to handle a difficult situation. We should all be aware of who we can turn to on our campus for such advice and when and if we need to seek legal counsel. Do not wait for a situation to arise and then find this out. Let's be proactive and know our resources ahead of time. What you see on the screen now is an additional resource, but they're not ethical principles. They're actually the Nakata core values. Both the uh, Nakata principles, or excuse me, all of the Nakata principles, the CAS standards, and these Nakata core values that we're looking at now can all be found on the Nakata website for additional information. Uh, we will see that uh, in, uh, in this list of Nakata core values, which is another resource, we see once again a great deal of overlap with what we've already discussed. These can be useful, however, in planning advisor development programs that I've mentioned before. Once again, the overlap is with respect. We have the same, some information about institutional expectations and the need to be knowledgeable about practices and procedures. And here are more values, once again, just so that your notes are comprehensive and complete. And now is the time in our presentation that we would like to get to the topic of how ethical pitfalls, meaning ethical difficulties, ethical dilemmas, ethical snafu, snafus can occur. These are the types of things that we try to avoid on our campus. No one wants to see them happen, and no one intentionally causes them to happen, but we do know that they do happen. A pitfall can simply uh, be when one advisor tells a student something about the requirements of a program, and another advisor, who maybe was trained differently or doesn't have the most recent updates on a particular program, uh, tells the student something different. So now you have a student receiving two different sets of information. This, of course, results in in inconsistency, which you can see is one of the sample pitfalls on the screen. And, of course, this has to be corrected. Sometimes realizing that this is happening on our campus is the most challenging part because unless a student brings it to our attention or we overhear someone, we might not know of these uh, discrepancies or um, inconsistencies. Um, so we would do all that we could to seek out that student once we knew that they had been provided two sets of information and clarify the uh, correct and accurate information. I'd like to share another example with you uh, about the uh, pitfalls. I happen to know an advisor who was trained by a very experienced advisor who then left. After the person's training or during the training, it included um, that for 30 some years, the previous advisor was allowed to use a certain course toward graduation requirements. Uh, 
Now, the new advisor went along using that same requirement, not realizing for one reason or another that the requirements had changed and that she was no longer able to use that particular course to meet the requirements for graduation. Um, now, this was only discovered, as you probably can imagine, when it was time to review the student's uh, application for graduation. Certainly not a good situation and one that we want to avoid on our campus. Well, but this has to be rectified. It has to be dealt with. So the next step would be for the advisor to meet with someone, a supervisor, perhaps a chair of a department, to do the best that he or she could do for the students who had been told uh, that the course would count. It, we have the ethical responsibility to do the most good and avoid the most harm for the students. First off would be, could the institution in any way continue to count this course for these students that had been told something else in error? Maybe that's possible, maybe it isn't, but that would be one of the avenues we would want to look into. Perhaps the students would be allowed to walk, even though they hadn't met the requirement, with the understanding that they would take the required course in the summertime. However a situation like this is resolved in the end, it is still considered a pitfall and one that we want to try to avoid. You see a list of other pitfalls on your screen. Now, sometimes when faced with challenging situations, similar to what I have described, and even sometimes more confusing, an advisor just cannot uphold all the principles of right action. The principles sometimes conflict with one another. In other words, we can't follow all of the guiding principles because if we did, we would run into difficulty with one or the other of them. Any time that this happens, this is called an ethical dilemma. On the screen, you will see types of ethical dilemmas that could arise in advising. As we review these, please consider dilemmas that may have occurred in your department or on your campus. I certainly hope that they are few, but think about to how the decisions were made at those particular times and can you associate our guiding ethical principles with the decisions that were made. Let's take a look at a situation where an advisor was approached by a student who wanted to withdraw from a course without academic penalty, but had missed the deadline for our particular campus of withdrawing um, without academic penalty. Now, the student, who in this particular case happened to come to your session uh, with their parent, went on to say that he didn't like the teacher, and he found the, the teacher difficult to understand. But, of course, you know, even though all that was happening in the class, they just never got around to doing the withdrawal. Now, the student feels that since the teacher doesn't do a good job teaching and they're not getting anything out of the class, he should still be allowed to withdraw and not have to stay in that class and not have any academic penalty. Well, let's say that it just so happens that this advisor has heard other students complain about the teacher, and the advisor knows the teacher and doesn't really believe in their mind's eye that this is one of the best instructors on campus. Now, the advisor will probably feel that they're faced with a dilemma. How do they help the student at the same time remain um, abide by fidelity to their colleagues and also fidelity to the institution and the deadlines? He or she wants to advocate for the student, but they must uphold all of the things that we just talked about. How would you handle this dilemma? Let's take a look at the next slide, which doesn't give us the answer first off, but gives us all the things that we would want to consider when faced with an ethical dilemma. How should we begin? How should we proceed? One of the most important steps is the first step. We need to assess the situation and really define what the problem is. It's very important here that we take out any drama or sensationalism because sometimes the real problem can be masked in the drama that surrounds a situation. Then, of course, we want to check the rules. We want to check current policies and procedures that are in place and know for sure how uh, accurate ones. We might, might want to ask ourselves, what might a reasonable person think about this? Certainly, it's always good to consult with colleagues and also turn to the literature. Um, what you're thinking about, is it rational? We should always be as quick as possible, and if we don't know the answer and cannot solve the problem, we would certainly want to try to refer the student. Remediate where it's appropriate, and continuing on the next slide, we should consider all possible solutions. In our effort to act quickly, don't be hasty. 
consider consequences of the various decisions. And if we take one course of right action, what will be the trickle-down effect as compared to another course of right action? We should document all situations that we in, uh, encounter in solving this dilemma, not just the problematic ones. And we always want to continue to review our own thoughts about ethics and their fit in our particular practice. Once again, we would want to act timely, and we have to be sure to do any follow-up and meet with other people that might be important to the follow-up. Now let's go back, excuse me, I'm going to back this up for a second. Now let's go back to the case that I had talked about, about the withdrawal. And I hope that you're thinking on your campus, what are the many things that you would think about in solving that? Uh, perhaps you're even talking to someone about it who's watching the webinar with you. Well, we have to follow the steps that we just saw. Assess the situation, check the rules. Um, we must investigate so that we have all the information to make an informed decision, consult with others where it is important and necessary, and consider all solutions. So let's take a look at the situation of withdrawal through the five ethical ideals. First, let's consider beneficence. Do as much good as we can. One of the first thoughts that might be is that we all have a responsibility to act as an advocate for the student. We also want to discern if the student is sincere. You know, how difficult is this class for them? So we would assess the situation and determine what is the real problem. The advisor would certainly want to explain all the ins and the outs of the withdrawal policy for that particular campus and why we have to have deadlines for these types of things. The advisor at this point should also speak with the student about their responsibility in meeting that deadline. And also, what are they doing in this course to be successful? Then, if the advisor thinks that the deadline could be waived in any way after consulting with a supervisor, and they find that there is a real reason to do so, not just the student's laziness, as the student themselves somewhat talked about, the advisor, of course, would check into that. Throughout the process, the advisor would empathize with the student. That's our advocacy. But what would that empathy look like is something we have to ask ourselves. Would the advisor tell the student that she does not consider that teacher to be a very good one either and that she has heard other complaints about the student? We all know that the answer to that question is of course not because that would be unethical. Speaking in such a way would defy the guideline of fidelity to a colleague. But the advisor can mention that they understand how difficult it is to be in a class sometimes that we find challenging and that if there are other things that impact the uh, challenge in that class, that makes our uh, task even more difficult. But then the advisor could discuss with the student a myriad of things that could be done in order for that student to be more successful in the class, especially if we cannot waive the deadline. Now that was all about beneficence, doing the most good that we could. Now let's consider non-maleficence in the same case. Non-maleficence, we remember, is decreasing the harm. The advisor could once again explain the withdrawal deadlines and consider if they could be adjusted, if they, which would be the best scenario and the least amount of harm to the student. If they cannot be adjusted, the advisor could counsel the student to speak with the teacher and perhaps ask if there are things that could happen in that classroom to help the student be successful, perhaps the creation of a study guide, or perhaps the, uh, asking um, additional questions so that the student would get more detail. Perhaps even, working through the proper channels, the, the uh, professor could be asked to maybe slow down their speech a little bit. The student could also seek additional support for the class, such as tutoring and other study groups. The advisor also might emphasize the correct timeline by which to withdraw so that the student does not make the same mistake in another semester. Regarding the student's complaints about the teacher, the advisor should explain the procedure for filing a complaint if the student chooses to do so, or perhaps on your campus it's called a conflict resolution form. The advisor would refer the student to the correct department and provide the most information, therefore reducing the most harm. An additional note about this case, out of respect for the colleague, once again, the advisor should not share with the student or the parent their own thoughts or background about the instructor because that would not resolve the student's problem and would be unethical. In this case, the advisor needs to consider the maximum number of ideals that they can uphold and which ones can be upheld to the greatest degree possible. If I may, I'd like to repeat that because that really is a guiding mantra for us. 
whenever we can't follow all of the ethical ideals. We want to try very hard to uphold the majority or the most ethical ideals that we can to the greatest degree that we can in order to help the student. I'd like now to move on to another case that you have before you of an ethical dilemma. Would you please take just a minute to review the case of the colleague? Um, I'd like to remind you at this time that there are other studies or other cases on your handouts that you can certainly use at the conclusion of this webinar or perhaps later on on your campus for additional advisor development. Now, regarding the case of the colleague, I'm sure that you might have a good deal to say about this. How would you, though, resolve it? Consider the various ethical guidelines that you could use to handle the situation. Here are some ideas. You would most importantly not want the students to leave with inaccurate information, so operating under non-maleficence and reducing the harm. You need to politely find some way to speak with this group, and perhaps that could be done by saying at the end that you would like to add a few additional pieces of information, and then you would find a very tactful, tactful in, in way of providing the students with the accurate information. This would actually help us to use the principles of beneficence and non-maleficence. Now, certainly, we would not want to embarrass this colleague in our um, relaying of the information by calling them out that they had given incorrect information. We would find a nice way to correct that information because that demonstrates both respect and fidelity to a colleague. Now, after the event, also under the guidelines of respect and fidelity, we should find a way to tell that colleague about the incorrect information and ask perhaps if they would like to, any help in the future with the next event. Or is there any more that, that uh, you need to provide them with in order to have complete information? So we were able to uphold almost all of, actually I think we got just about all of them, uh, in coming up with a resolution to this dilemma. Now, perhaps one of the most important concepts of this webinar today is the need to provide professional development for all advisors in the areas of ethical decision making in advising. Once again, here is a little review of the steps to consider when faced with ethical challenges or dilemmas. Decide first what is really the problem or the dilemma. Take away any additional parts of the story. Consider all the policies, procedures, rules, and guidelines that could help you to resolve the dilemma. Consult the CAS standards, the NACADA values, the guidelines for advising, and the general ethical principles that we've discussed. Determine the best way to proceed, and check with others for their opinions. Of course, if we need to, consult with legal counsel when necessary, hoping that most of the time that is not going to be the case. In just a few words, we could use as a general guiding strategy that was when confronted with conflicting, conflicting principles, do the best you can to follow all of them to the great extent possible. And this information came to us originally through Mark Lowenstein in 2008. Now, sometimes for a tougher situation, Advisors might want to consider other resources, such as those described in the three rules of management. According to the three rules of management, we could use the rule of private gain to help us make a decision. This simply tells us that we should, uh, a decision should not be made because an individual or a group of individuals uh, would gain at the expense of others. Also from this publication, we have the, the uh, the thought process of if everyone does it. Well, we all know that if everyone does it, that doesn't mean that someone's not getting hurt or it is the right course of action. So that is not a reason to also do something. However, surprisingly maybe, sometimes asking ourselves this question could actually point out what is the best course of action, what would be unethical, and what would be a, an accurate course of action to take. Now, also, we have benefits versus burden. Sometimes, once again, when we cannot uphold all of the um, general guiding principles, which would have the most benefit or the least burden? Uh, this guiding print, this uh, actual uh, 
just thought process is very much like the golden rule. We could ask ourselves when using this principle to help us determine a course of, act, a course of action. If the benefit does not outweigh the burden, then perhaps it is not the best course of action and would not cause the least amount of harm. Another resource to consider could be Kidder's resolution principles from his book, How Good People Make Tough Choices. Kidder provides us with three philosophies of thought in his publication. However, Kidder does not provide us with answers. These are just rather um, philosophies or ways to think about things, or I guess you could look at it as different ways to look at a situation. The first way would be ends-based thinking. Much like beneficence, this considers uh, bringing out the greatest good for the greatest number. Rules-based thinking would be, when considering the rules of action, consider the ones that you want others to take a look at if you were the one that was being impacted by this. And care-based thinking, this is also similar to the golden rule. Do to others what you would want them to do to you. This can be another wonderful uh, resource that could possibly be used in helping us to make uh, decisions when we are confronted with ethical dilemmas or confusing situations. Now this actually brings us to the conclusion of the slides of the webinar. Please consider the many resources that are available uh, to you to assist with ethical issues in advising. And please remember the words of John Wesley that I would like to use to conclude the webinar today. And those words are, whenever we are dealing, we are working in our environments and in our own practice, do all the good that we can, by all the means that you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. I want to wish you all best wishes in your advising practice and on your campuses. And now I'd like to turn the mic back over to Lee, or to the voice of Lee, for any questions that we have had come in. Lee? Thank you, Joanne. Let's look at just three um, overarching things that I think Joanne will cover the, the basics of the questions that we have available. And the first one, um, is there anything else that you would like to add to what you've already said in terms of what can be the best way to avoid getting into a situation? Well, this is certainly a really good question, Lee. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind is training, training, training. Um, we, we train in many things on our campus, but sometimes we don't think about topics such as ethical issues and e even the legal implications uh, that is the webinar that we had last uh, month. Uh, it is so important that our advisors are made aware um, of the ethical responsibilities that we have and guidelines that we can use to keep us uh, ethic ethically sound. Um, I have to say, and this is probably a little unfortunate, most of my uh, situations that I talked about today have really happened. And although some of them seem absurd, people who were in those situations did not have anything to refer to in their own minds in order to help them act on the spot and do what was ethically the best thing to do. In addition to that, I would say that just being knowledgeable, being up to date on policies, procedures, practices, and being sure that all of our publications are accurate and up to date. I know uh, even on my own campus to make sure that everything is in sync and to make sure that student affairs advisors know everything that faculty might be doing or uh, slight changes in their programs, making sure that academic affairs and student affairs are always collaborating and sharing the necessary information. Uh, other than that, I would say we need to use the ethical ideals to uh, create correct courses of action. Uh, we would want to provide um, ethical guidelines to uh, anyone who's involved in our decision making. I think I think that would that would help us out a great deal. Okay, so there will be times that we can avoid them. I think you've given us uh, some ideas there about what we can do to prepare in case they come, training, some other things. Anything else that you can think of? Well, I guess we have to be aware that what we've been talking about program? today is one set of tools, the tools that provide us with the foundation for how to make our decisions, sort of our uh, foundation, foundational guidelines. But 
if an advisor encounters a difficult situation and, and let's say that they need to pull from something else, we should refer to our other additional tools, such as the advising models on our campus, and does that have anything to do with the decisions that we make? Being very resourceful and reaching out to our, uh, to our professional networks. Our professional networks can be very helpful sometimes when we find ourselves in very conflicting situations. And then um, oftentimes we need to pull from other uh, theories, such as student development theory. I think if we consider all of that, that would help us to be well prepared when a situation arises. Okay, and then the final aspect I think we might want to consider a little bit more is who who might we consult when we do have face a dilemma? Okay, um, just really not this one is a little more difficult to answer only because who to consult on, on a campus would be very individualized to that campus. However, the most important point here is to know for your campus and for your organizational structure, with whom would you consult? Now, we all know that the first thing that comes to mind is that we always want to let our supervisor know. We never want someone else to be telling our supervisor some um, dilemma that we're facing and we haven't told the supervisor first. That way the supervisor can help guide us and also uh, determine whether or not this needs to be reported, as I call it, reporting up. I feel that reporting up is extremely important. Sometimes uh, that reporting up has to go all the way to the person on your campus that has the most connections with legal services. Sometimes uh, we just need to let our um, legal services know we may be in touch, but also does a situation have to be reported to an insurance company because it could turn into a more serious situation. All of this has to do with the advisor talking with the supervisor, the supervisor talking with the person to whom they report, and somewhere in that chain of command making the decision, do we have to turn to external uh, re either resources or counsel or let someone know about a situation. I think that if we remember to inform the correct people, that can help us to at least uh, troubleshoot the best situation, uh, to troubleshoot a situation in the best way possible. Well, thank you. Okay. okay. I think that covers all of the questions that I'm seeing today. So I think that will complete our webinar. Thank you for being with us today, Joanne. Just, I'm just really excited about this idea of that being our 50th event. I think that's just such a wonderful milestone, and I think this is a really great topic for us to be talking about to mark that milestone. So thank you for coming back. You're welcome, Lee, and it always is my pleasure to be here. And I hope that, especially for those who didn't access the handout ahead of time, that when they do get to that handout, they'll see that there are additional uh, cases or situations that can be used for additional discussion, um, maybe following this webinar or sometime in the future on campuses. Absolutely, yes, that's great, helpful material.